Hi, I'm Sal McCagliano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, former Merchant Mariner, and an instructor in maritime industry policy, maritime security, and maritime history. Welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, The Shipping Crisis of 2021, I Have That Sinking Feeling Edition. I have been doing this show now for since really March when uh, Ever Given went aground in the Suez, started doing my What's Going On in the Suez version of this, and since then I've morphed this podcast, video, YouTube, whatever you want to call it, into a kind of synopsis of what's going on with shipping, find the biggest news in shipping and kind of convey it to you. And I got to say, number one, thank you to everybody who's subscribed and followed along. Almost 8,000 subscribers now on my YouTube channel. I By no means did I ever think this would happen. So I appreciate that, number one. Number two is this story, especially the story of shipping, is starting to get some traction in the media, which I think is really important. One of the reasons I started this was to provide an outlet of some information about shipping to those of you who don't spend the time, like I do, perusing through the journals and, and online sources that are out there. And so today I really wanna kind of focus on that and really start off this week by looking at what's going on with shipping because I have to say that the mainstream media are getting into it, it's hitting there, but more importantly, people are starting to realize the implications of this. This is a story in Business Insider, Why the World is in a Shipping Crisis by Rachel Premick. And I think she does a great job of putting together a concise, tight, little news story that really has massive implications about what is looming on the horizon here. Uh, absolutely fantastic job. Just really, uh, my hat's off to her on it. And I just want to talk about some of the issues that she hits here because she hits, I think, a lot of the key issues in some detail. Number one, the escalating price of containers around the world, how much it costs to ship goods around the world via, by, uh, via containers. So this is the Drewy's World Container Index. Drewy is, is a company that really looks at container freight rates and markets. And one of the things, all you have to look at this chart to understand it is see where freight rates had been since 2012, where they dipped down in 2016, where they were last year at this time. And now they are just absolutely spiking up 282% since last year. And we'll go into some more detail about that in a second. Next aspect of her story, she's talking about our world's weird new mega ships. She's hitting on the story that I've talked about with you all quite a bit, the growth of these large, massive container ships, the ultra large container ships, which are best personified by ships like Ever Given that really brought everyone into the limelight about how important these vessels are. Next, she goes into the issue about no ships. And this goes back to the early half of 2020, when all of a sudden, when COVID hit, which I, I wasn't doing this broadcast at the time, so I wasn't talking about it, but I was following it quite a bit, is by the early 2020, all of a sudden, we saw what happened was a, a massive drop in cargo being moved. First, the shutdown in China, then the reduction in consumption overseas in the United States and Europe. And what we saw was the beginning of what they call these blank sailings. They started canceling sailings. And you saw the reduction, almost 20% capacity was, was blanked, was cut out. And ships, shipping companies, the, the large, uh, big shipping companies were, were laying up ships, actually. Uh, they were not. They were trying to get, you know, they didn't want to send ships half full. So they were consolidating their ships. Uh, this is a big story that we were talking about at the time. Now, all of a sudden, you have this. By the latter half of 2020, people are buying stuff. Can't go out, can't go anywhere, so let me buy those things, treadmills, couches, whatever I want to buy. And now all of a sudden consumption starts speaking, and now all of a sudden you got to get those ships back on track, start flowing them. Again, the problem is, and it's not mentioned in the story, but it really should be, is the constraints within ports because of COVID restrictions and the, the difficulty in starting to clear material out of ports. Again, she, she talked about a lot of key things in here. I think she does a great job in this story. So we're talking about the delays in ports. Next, no containers. The issue about containers, ran a story the other day, talked about the fact that there are three companies in China that produce nearly all the containers in the world. But the problem is we're not backfilling containers. Empty containers are not heading back across the ocean. It's not just in the United States, it's everywhere. And this is causing uh, issues right now. And then again, the, the story here, at least, uh, at least the shipping uh, scions are doing well. Again, those big companies, again, I showed you a video the other day, and we talked about the fact that 10 largest companies, shipping companies in the world, control 85% of the container 
they are doing extremely well. Even though they've lost money past few years, they are making money hand over fist. It is a printing machine of money for them. They are doing extremely well. So I thought this is a great story. I'm hoping it gets picked up by more people start realizing what's going in. But I want to break down part of the story and some pieces for you and go in a little bit more detail beyond what Rachel did in the story. Again, I think she does a great job. So this story was in CNBC. CNBC will sometimes, a lot of these business channels will catch this stuff. They talk about this in some ways. But this story grabbed my attention. How bad are global shipping snafus? Home Depot contracted its own container ship as a, a safeguard. It is really unheard of for an individual company to charter, to, to voyage charter a vessel. But that's what's happening here. Home Depot will make sure, because what's happening is the container companies and the freight forwarders are charging more and more to haul containers and they're charging that container rate. It may actually be more economical for them to just charter a vessel and then Home Depot can fill it up with whatever containers they want. They're paying for the for the vessel now. They don't have to worry about paying per container. They have the vessel. They can sail it back and forth. They can sit it there. They can do whatever they want. But by the terms of their contract, I'm not sure what their contract is and which ship they have specifically chartered yet. I'm hoping to find that out. But now they're going to be able to move containers themselves between Asia and the United States to ensure that their shipment is moving. Now, that doesn't alleviate the issue that they're going to have in getting those containers out of the terminals, out of the ports, and into the interior of the United States. That's still an issue that's going on with them. But even chartering container ships is a big issue. This is a story out of American Shipper. Greg Miller is doing great uh, reporting again. Uh, I, I think Greg does a great job with it, with this, and he's really hitting this with American Shipper. Container ship scores off the charts fantasy rate. Uh, <coughs> I, I can't even say it. $135,000 a day. I literally got choked up trying to save that. I can't tell you how crazy that number is to charter a vessel. It is It is. Absolutely unheard of. A 15-year-old container ship with a capacity of 5,000 containers. 5,000. It is, it is nuts that they're paying that much. Again, come down here. Uh, the colossal rate is substantially higher than the already whopping 70 to 90,000 per day employed for the CMA CGM Opal. Uh, this is just a, a, a value and a, and a number that just I, I, I can't even figure it out how much they're paying for that. I wanted to see if they had the chart here. They may not have it in this story. Let me see if I can find it for you. So this is the early story from Greg. I meant to catch and I didn't have it there for you. So I apologize. But this is uh, back in May. He wrote this. Why st uh, stratospheric container rates could rocket even higher. Come back down here. He's got this mentioned here. One leading freight forwarder executive told American Shipper in August 2020, if they didn't expect, I didn't think there's room for growth beyond $4,000 per unit. Importers commonly pay eight to $10,000. they are talking about it going up to almost $20,000 dollars per container. This story here out of Lodestar talks about this. It's talking about $20,000 per 40-foot unit as this new crisis unfolds. Uh, just an amazing cost either per container or for chartering a vessel, as in the case here that we're seeing uh, uh, with, with uh, uh, Home Depot chartering a vessel. But the idea that you're paying $135,000 uh, to charter this. And again, one of the things that the groups that are chartering these vessels, especially these, are the large 10 container line of companies. They're going out there and hitting up the companies that have vessels uh, that are available. There's a large group of, of companies that maintain vessels and put them out here. They talk about these, what they call NOOs, non-operating owners. So you have like Danos, uh, C-SPAN, Global Ship Lease, Navios, uh, Euro Seas. What they do is they operate, they, they build the ships, they charter them out to other companies. They don't get into the into it. They, they're kind of like the U-Haul and the rider truck of, 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 of shipping in some ways. They have the fleet of vessels and you come and get them and use them as you see fit. It, it's just amazing what's about to happen here. This story on GCAM, again, talks about this even some more. It's a Bloomberg story, out of control shipping costs, fire up prices from coffee to toys. Ran a story last month, I think it was, talking about Christmas in May, talking about doing the Christmas shopping early. I think that's going to be a big issue because I don't think we're going to have everything we think we're going to have. We're seeing shortages in key components for TVs, for automobiles, you name it. And I think we're going to see this really start to play out at a big level for both uh, wholesalers and retailers. 
uh, in many ways. You're seeing this happen. And again, uh, the shipping companies are eating this up because this is profit from them. They're just jacking up pr uh, prices and rates uh, for containers across the ocean. Come on over here to Splash 24-7 story by Sam Chambers. More than 300 liners are waiting for birth space container congestion map globally. So we've talked about the issue on the West Coast of the United States, Los Angeles, Long Beach quite a bit. But one of the things that Sam goes in here, it's not just Los Angeles, Long Beach. It's from Am Amsterdam to Auckland, from Chicago to, to Seattle. Uh, we're seeing ships jammed up. They have this map right here to show you where these jam ups are taking place. Uh, off of uh, Charleston, Savannah, right here, off Rotterdam, off Algeciras, uh, off, off of uh, uh, the Dardanelles to get in, off of Suez. Uh, and more importantly, look at these numbers off the coast of China right now, 83, 75, just massive clusters of vessels. Even coming out of Nigeria, this is the oil facilities coming out of Nigeria. We're seeing these clusters take place. And all of this is meaning that the global supply network is slowing down. What shippers want is ships continually moving. They get money when the ships are moving, but when they sit, they don't make as much money. But I have to say that's usually true, except when you start getting charter rates and container values of this amount. I, I'm not sure how this is breaking right now because we haven't really seen this happened before. We're seeing escalating charter rates for vessels. We're seeing escalating freight rates for vessels. Uh, come over to this story. Again, things making it into the mainstream. This is Wall Street Journal's opinion page. Uh, behind your long wait for packages. This was a, a piece that was done here by uh, Peter Tershwell on June 2nd. Global supply trains are buckling, driving up prices, creating shortages, no space in the clogs, ports. And so he wrote this piece, which I found really interesting, again, on the Wall Street Journal, in the opinion page. It's making the news. But then a few days later, this piece hit. And this was written by the CEO of the West Coast Ports right here, uh, right here, excuse me, the Pacific Maritime Association, Jim McKenna, president and CP, uh, CEO, wrote this, this kind of rebuttal. And what, what he talks about here, sorry, terminal vessel backlogs in Los Angeles, Long Beach resulted from a cumulative collapse of the entire logistics supply chain that has been overwhelmed by the historic cargo surge dating to April of last year. Warehouses are filled, causing backups, made worse by shortage of shipping containers, rail cars, trucks, ch chassis, dwell times, which measures how long a container remains at a table, peaked in January at over five days, more than twice the standard length. Through it all, longshoremen workers have worked more hours and moved record levels of cargo. In, a con in increasingly congested terminals. Many terminals were forced to keep ships idle and at times not use longshoremen workers to offload containers because there was no space for cargo. So he wrote this rebuttal piece, which I think is a very interesting rebuttal piece. And he talks about the idea of solutions need to encompass the entire logistics network that stretches hundreds of miles from the waterfront. So one of the things you should be asking yourself, and, and if not, I'm going to ask it, the Par Pacific Maritime Association, who is this? Who is this? So the Pacific Maritime Association is actually a conglomerate of the shipping firms that use the ports on the West Coast. And their president or CEO, as they mentioned here, is this guy right here, James McKenna, Pacific Maritime, proudly represent the world's leading maritime companies who do business on the West Coast. We have roughly 1 million tons of cargo through the West Coast every day. Uh, what I want you to find that's really interesting that they don't like to talk about too much, over 70 member companies make up this. This is their board of directors. This is the 11 member board of director directors. Uh, What's interesting about the 11 members is four of them are American companies, but the other seven are not. And these are the voting members that basically determine ships that get offloaded, the allocation of workers and crews on ships on the West Coast. And you'll see here, you know, here's the guy from Evergreen. Uh, Evergreen, again, is Taiwanese. ONE o uh, -E is basically Japanese. CMA is French. SSA Marine, that is an American. These are the uh, uh, port workers. Uh, Pacific Crane, this is the guys who work the cranes. This is American. Matson is American. They operate between the U.S. and Hawaii. Uh, Maersk, that's Danish. Costco, that's Chinese. Um, uh, mainland Chinese, People's Republic of China. Hapag Lloyd, that is German. Mediterranean Shipping, that's Swiss. And Pasha, Pasha Hawaii is also a uh, Jones Act, U.S. to Hawaii. So four of the 11 are American companies that basically vote, but seven of them are overseas shipping companies that have a control on the Pacific West Coast, which again, I think is, is, is fairly significant. Uh, if you go down here, you'll find here, this is their 2020 Pacific Maritime Association report. This is it right here. 
Uh, you can find a lot of great details in here about this. One of the things that I find really interesting here is I'm going to highlight two areas for you that I found really interesting. So one is this table right here, which talks about the wage, the history of longshoremen straight time wage rates. Uh, way back in July of 1934, they were making 95 cents hourly. Uh, during World War II, kind of locks in there at about $1.10 on an hourly rate. And if you go through here, you see the escalation in rates. And I just want to show you the jump here from 2000 when they were making $27.18 to July 4th, 2020, $44.84, becoming very expensive to use U.S. ports. Uh, obviously because of the labor. I'm not criticizing that. I'm just making an observation that, that, it, that it is expensive to use U.S. ports. So I found this one in here too. How does 44.84 an hour add up to $195,000 a year? Uh, if you look at this, one of the things they talk of, a review of annual earnings found on page 61 shows the full-time registered workers, those paid 2,000 hours or more, earn on average nearly 195,000 per year. For long showing residents, the average is 182,000. For clerks, it's 203, and for foremen, $280,000. God bless them all. I'm telling you right now, if you can make that much money working on docks, that's great. But this is an issue that does cause difficulties in U.S. ports. It makes it very expensive to operate in and around U.S. ports. It's also one of the reasons why we see, for example, in China. A, a crane operator, and I pulled this off the internet, so I apologize if this is not an accurate number, but I did for a crane operator in Shanghai making about $20,000 a year comparable to what you see they're making here in the United States. Add to it that China is automating their ports immensely so that they can run 24-7. And this is one of the issues that, that's really having a hampering factor in the United States. I do not want to take anyone's job away from, especially Americans. I'm a big advocate for the American merchant marine and American workers. But this is an issue that makes it expensive to operate in the United States, which, again, should be passed on to the shipping companies, which unfortunately then pass that on to consumers. And we see that happen all the time. So I thought I'd end this video on the shipping crisis of 2021 on this. This is a story, again, just came out on Freight Waves, uh, talking about trade in the United States. And again, one of the things we focus on a lot, especially in my videos, is on international shipping and trade. Understand that our biggest trading partners right now in the world are Mexico, number one, Canada, number two. China comes in at number three. And we still do a lot of trade across the borders. And I think that's really important to understand. Uh, one of the things that this is pushing, and I think it's, it's really important to come back to the original story that started this all, and this is the story here by Rachel Premick, is why the world is in a shipping crisis today. Way back in 1917, or 19, uh, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson declared the first presidential emergency directive. And he uh, declared it because we were in a shipping crisis, he basically said. Uh, we find ourselves at the mercy of foreign merchant marines. The British were constraining our trade because they needed it for their war effort. The Germans were sinking our vessels because of the war effort. And in many ways, we find ourselves in a shipping crisis today. The world is in a shipping crisis, but we, the United States, also find ourselves in a shipping crisis. So it's very important, I think, for the United States going forward to develop a national maritime strategy. How are we going to deal with this? Are we going to be dependent on these companies that are international without a lot of American oversight and control. I'm going to do a special on talking about that later on, you know, or should we start thinking about what are we doing to ensure that there's more U.S. involvement in this trade to make sure that our key commodities, our key goods are coming in. Home Depot has that answer. They're, they're getting a ship. They're going to charter a ship to do it. Probably be a foreign flag ship. I don't know, but they're getting a ship to do it. So maybe we need to be thinking about following the Home Depot model. So anyway, this is Sal Mercagliano. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Uh, if you like it, please subscribe. Go ahead, hit that uh, like button. Uh, give it a thumbs up so that it'll be shared on other YouTube uh, platforms. Please share it with, with people you know. Uh, and also hit the bell so that when new videos come out, you'll get alerted to them as they are posted. So this is Sal signing off. Uh, make sure you get going on that Christmas shopping early this year, folks.